Right? Uh, we'll talk later. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Hey. <laughs> um, can I ask you guys to continue talking amongst yourself because Maria is just did not go to, down to nap and I haven't even gotten to open my outline and I'm just trying not to be freaked out right now <laughs> that I'm late because of my three and a half year old twins. So it's okay. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Talk amongst yourselves. Hang on. Anyway, it's nice to meet everyone. I can't wait to hear more. I'm so loving this sky from Bethany right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still learning how to do the different gallery views and like don't I know this yet? Hey. Amazing. You know the oh. software keeps changing, so as soon as you figure it out, it changes. <laughs> and it takes me a long time to begin with. And then I'm like, I got it. There's a new version. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. So happy to see all the gems and the fans who are here. And um, I am going to do one of the strategies that Adrienne Marie Brown talks about in her emergent strategy book, which we, we talk about during the gems course, which is less prep more presence because i can't even find my outline and i just spent an hour and a half trying to put a kid to bed who's screaming still at this moment so i'm just gonna try to <laughs> forgive myself for that and like be present with you guys and keep in mind what i initially wanted out of the graduation ceremony and we're gonna be fine <laughs> we're gonna go with that so uh, my name is Clara, and I just want to give you a little background in case you don't know about what this think tank is, the Youth Volume Think Tank, which we are enjoying right now. And this is the fourth Youth Volume Think Tank ever. Um, the first one was a few summers ago when a bunch of Suzuki teachers got together to try to come up with tangible ways that we could diversify our studio i mean nurture our studios with diversity inclusion and equity and just share ideas so that's what we're still doing and it's also doubling as the graduation ceremony for the course of action growing equitable music studios and this is the third teachers cohort of five teachers to graduate or hang out together with me four hours a week for six weeks <laughs> and talk about specific things about our studios and set aside that time to just like think and brainstorm and do thought experiments and dream and give each other feedback and just be not alone in in this effort. <laughs> so um, I'm so happy to be here. And we are going to start with a little ceremony, uh, opening ceremony that we do for during the gem sessions, um, which is to take a few deep breaths while I light the candle on our altar. But first I wanna 
show you our little altar. So well, we, first we have our little sign that changes every week. <laughs> and it's graduation week. And this is just like my office. I got some new plants too, but just imagine that you're hanging out in my office with me. And growing Equitable Music Studios, accompanied by this little turtle that symbolizes never hurry, never stop, which is something Dr. Suzuki used to say. And I have since like interpreted that to be um, that resting and self-care are not stopping and we're not hurrying. <laughs> we are doing this for the long run and we're doing things that will sustain us for the long run and being intentional and serious about that as part of the work. Heart from Bethany. <laughs> and then we also have this piece of art from Dr. Suzuki um, that says, one is the product of their environment, it has like his handwriting on it. And he sent this to me when I was six years old and I wrote him a birthday card and mailed it to Japan. <laughs> um, and I just love it because it's, it, you can also interpret it from a social justice viewpoint and say like, we need to change the current environment. So like, things like this doesn't happen. And um, everyone gets an equitable chance to be happy and content and collaborate together. And so I'm going to light the candle on the altar. And your job is to take three deep breaths to yourself. And say good job for taking this time today to like think about these subjects and get ready for the next hour or so for us together. Just keep breathing and I'm going to read some affirmations, which is another practice that we tried out during gems. What does doing daily affirmations, how does that make you feel when you're doing your work? And we have a few that I've gathered that you can feel free to repeat after me. To yourself or in your head or just keep breathing just for about a minute i am growing equitable music studios healing powers lie within me and i use music to access them Everything that I need to succeed is within me already. Doors of opportunity and abundance open to me and my students now. I'm thankful for all my blessings and I share them with others happily. I use my head to live with heart. I listen to the wisdom within myself. I live by my inner knowledge and strength.
I am allowing myself to be great. I am in love with who I am right now. I am an amazing person. And then before we get started with the sharing from the current GEMS cohort, and anyone else who wants to share later. I want you to, you can keep your eyes closed if you want and imagine your students. And think about what is the main thing that you want to nurture in them. One of the number one things. And then go ahead and put that in the chat once you have it. I love the, the, the gems are like, I know, immediately. I thought about this. Nice. This is awesome. Okay. Nice. So there's no one wrote great bowl hold. Imagine that. <laughs> and so knowing this, one of the things that we we did in gems was think just think about how do we organize our studios around this foundational like greater why for ourselves. And how do we communicate that in our studio culture that shows people um do they know our greater why do the parents and and students know what we're really trying to do or do they think we just value them based on whether they graduated book one yet <laughs> um, and how do we talk about this stuff so i like to invite the gems now to just share for a few minutes what was um tell us about your teaching scenario uh how long you've been teaching and what was the most impactful thing about gems or the concept from a certain week that made the biggest impact on you or that you're the most excited to share with the other teachers 
um, and then tell us about a tangible action step that you're taking within that category because this whole think tank is to generate tangible actions that we can take in our own studios to nurture our studios with equity. So I am going to go in alphabetical order. Christian's like, is it me? <laughs> Just like in class. And I would like to introduce Christian Sands from Detroit. And he's a cellist, teaches multiple instruments. Um, and I will let you let him tell you about his his teaching scenario currently and take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Christian. Um, my current teaching scenario is uh, a bit everywhere. Um, <laughs> I teach uh, in a few schools and I teach for Sphinx um, as well. And I have like my private studio and uh, I go to high schools and do cello sectionals. Um, it's, it's a bit everywhere. Um, you, you'll see me from one end of Metro Detroit to the other and then all the way up in Flint. Um, one of the things that has been the, um, the most important, I think, and this has been something that I've always struggled with, is sustainability. And so one of the things when I was younger and before the pandemic, I just thought and believed that I just had an overflowing well of energy that I could constantly just be running from one place to the next, teach for a few hours, run to a rehearsal, play for a few hours, wake up, do the same thing the next day. Um, and one of the things about it is I'm realizing now, and I, I've known it, but like I didn't believe it, I guess, is <laughs> that I can only do so much with the limited 24 hours I have in each day. So I can't do everything that I think I want to do. <laughs> and also, if I do everything, then how much of it am I doing well? Um, I um, have been teaching uh, for almost 10 years, which says a lot because I've been teaching since I was in high school. Um, I'm also pretty young. Um, <laughs> and um, how old are you? Just so I like am. You. I am 25. Oh, my gosh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing so, great, though. I'm so um, proud of you. And one of the things that I've been doing to as an action step is saying no. I've said no to a lot of things in these past few weeks. And, you know, it's very difficult for me to say no because I want to, again, I want to be able to do everything. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, there are not enough hours in the day or the week for me to do them well or at all. <laughs> So just accepting that I can't say yes to everything has been, it's one of my biggest challenges these days is just trying to make sure that I can say no <laughs> and being okay with saying no. <laughs> and what's one of the ways that you're saying no um, to make space for new full scholarship students next fall? Well, I'm going to be um, reducing a lot of the teaching that I do, not like my specific students, but there are a few things that I'm just going to be cutting from my schedule because I just, I can't, I can't continue to accommodate what I'm uh, dealing with. And also part of me needs to become less dependent on the uh, stores or businesses that I've been operating out of. So I'm going to my plan is hopefully in the fall of next year, probably in the summer, I will leave like the store that I just started working at this summer. But um, because it's just, it's not sustainable. <laughs> like what I'm trying to do. I mean, it's a great program, but it's not offering me the, uh, it's not sustainable for myself to drive all the way out there and try to accommodate everything that they want me to do. 
on top of all of the other things that I'm trying to do. So it's just not, I can't accommodate it. So mm-hmm. I'm, my plan is to reduce my schedule to the point that I can take care of everything, but also I still have time to relax and not be working, which is a new concept for me. <laughs> awesome um are there any other things that you want to tell everyone about that you planned during the last few weeks so um one of the things that i'm really hoping to get uh organized and together is my hope is that I will be able to teach children in the uh, Detroit public schools and offer them these opportunities for lessons. Um, Specifically, um, Martin Luther King High School right now, the teacher there is actually the first person who put an instrument, instrument in my hand. So it would be very nice to actually be able to give back to uh, him and his, uh, his students in that way. So that is my plan as of right now. My plan is also to, hopefully it can grow into something of more than what it's gonna start as is my, my hope. And I think it can. And so it would be nice to, and this is where I get, I get overexcited because like part of my brain is like, oh, it could be King. It could also be Cass. It could also be Renaissance. But how about we just start with just one and see if we can make one work? Again, saying no. <laughs> and how many students are you hoping to raise scholarships for um, my hope is to November raise, 30th? My hope is to raise enough money for two students for the school year next year. Nice. And so your goal is 5,000? Yes. For your For my two Facebook students and administration stuff. Fundraising. Yes. And that was enough. Do you want to tell them about that? One of the things um, that I've never done or given really much thought to is all of the time that we have to spend coordinating with parents and facilities and um, in order to accommodate like times and things. I've never even considered that to be a part of my, uh, it's a part of my job description, but I thought it was just something I had to do. So right now I'm wrapping my head around the concept of, oh, I should be paid for working (laughs) in in the capacity that I'm not used to. (laughs) Cause I, in my head, it was all lumped into one and it really shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. so making the commitment to doing extra administrative work with the fundraising for example would be one of the things that would take more time and then folding in money to pay yourself for that because that that's what the equity work is and the community is happy to support that and that's what is required to get the equity to happen is extra work because of the system that we're in right now. So they need to pay for that too, not just the teaching hours. Wonderful. I'm excited for you. Um, Does anyone have any questions for Christian right now? Okay, and there'll be time later too. So the next person in alpha, oh, Karen has a question. Mm -hmm. Do you have, hi, Christian. How are you? (laughs) Hey, do you have any, what are some ideas that you were going to do to um, raise money for your students? So we're going to do, I'm going to do the uh, Facebook campaign, the Facebook fundraising um, event. Also, in my head, and I have a few connections at like some churches, I want to be able to put on like a fundraising concert, like just as a way to to um, 
to uh, raise some money, but also I get to play and show off my skills as a way. And then hopefully my hope is that then like I'll do that concert and then the next year it's like the students playing at the concert. So that way it can be like, oh, he did this concert for fundraising and then the next year the students are doing the concert for fundraising. So that's my plan. Um, I did a lot of, um, one of the other things that my plan is to do is to do a lot of, um, starting in 2022 is to do be more present on uh, social media. And that is gonna be um, a part of my uh, fundraising strategy. So um, it's, it's interesting because the fundraising is always the, the interesting figuring out where the puzzle pieces will fit. So um, my hope is that it can, there can be a successful uh, Facebook campaign and then there can be a successful concert and then the concert can grow into the successful event that fundraises for it each year. Mm -hmm. So it's an annual plan that you're going to use. Hopefully. Okay. Cool. So Karen, would you like to be next? <laughs> yes. Welcome Karen, another Detroiter. I swear everyone isn't from Detroit in this group, but some of them are, a lot of them. <laughs> so tell us your name, how long you've been teaching, where you teach in your context of your teaching scenario. Okay, so my name is Karen Vesprini. I am a music together teacher, so it's a lot different from Suzuki, but it's a lot it's similar in a lot of ways too, um, because the guy who started uh, music together his uncle had the publishing rights to the suzuki book one and i want to say book two too so he did a lot of research about suzuki and how uh, why are people dropping out after book two and through that he developed this whole program of music development for for babies to zero to five and it started with that premise and it's been around i, I think near close to 30 years and just being a part of it and is I just love, love it. So I sing and dance with parents and their children, zero to five. And it's based on um, like a collection, different named collections. And throughout, we sing the songs and develop ways to play with it. Super fun <laughs> throughout. And so um, <clears throat> and I teach, you know, or I share with parents how to do that. And we get ideas and stuff like that. So that's pretty much my music. And before that I was a musician in bands and then I have four children who all play instruments and music is just what we do. So I was a homeschool mom and that was a huge part of my curriculum. Um, the main part actually, <laughs> the first part of it. And so through music together, um, I'm able to fulfill my music and being with children. And so now what I've learned through GEMS is, um, not that you don't know how to have self-care, but to remember you are important enough to pour into yourself. Not only, you know, do you know a little bit of this, but just really love yourself. And one of our affirmations is, I'm in love with myself. And that's everything. And from that, just learning, um, you know, music, like with music together, there's not a lot of children or families who, or teachers mainly who look like me. And now, um, but what I love about the program is it's very diverse in the different musical styles, the different rhythm patterns and things of that nature. So it's diverse in that, but to the, the families and, and especially social economic um, people who have a certain social economic background who may not be able to afford something as wonderful as this program. Um, so it goes to a lot of different things. For, for, and all children, music learning supports all learning. And all children have the right to be able to be exposed to all this wonderful stuff. And um, Clara showed us a lot of ways on. And at first it was, I didn't know what to expect with the, with the course. And I'm like, eh. I felt like I was answering everything wrong and I was like answering from another place. And once I start to understand equity 
and it's different than equality. And I think one week we talked about not only being invited to the party, but being asked to dance. Mm -hmm. You know, that part of it where you feel included. You know, inclusion means we're all doing it together. There's no separate anyone. We're all experiencing the same thing. And you helped me to understand that we, you know, to reiterate what I know and to make me feel more grounded in it, that, um, you know, all children deserve this. And so how am I going to build my studio, which is not really my studio because I work for two different directors and we, I teach outside, I teach in, now we're back in spaces and I'm going to be teaching at the War Memorial. They're going to have classes now and it's, I just love where my career and music together is going too. Um, but I don't have a, my own studio and I love to be that support teacher anyway, but how can I build their music classes? I'm going to call it, we call it, we change, we do say studio now, Clara and Clara, you're very good at helping develop verbiage for what you want to say. And even if we have something that we're feeling and we came up with, she has a wonderful way of wrangling us back to our main under thoughts and helping us word that in the form of being clear mm -hmm. and intentional on what our focus is and help us with a short term and a long term plan in executing it. And so one of my goals is to get more students in my class that look like me who when they see a teacher who looks like me, it's okay. Cause all my students love me and I love them and we they all look different and we just, a lot of them don't look like me. My children don't even look like me. <laughs> you know, <it's> okay. <laughs> yes, but, but it is important to see that, you know, and I think people feel more comfortable. And we talked about, you know, sometimes organizations invite people, you know, we have a scholarship and we wanna, you know, we wanna give it to black teachers or, you know, Latino teachers, but, they don't understand the climate of when it's not that they don't have the money, they don't feel invited. And then it's the passive aggressive feeling when you get in there and it's like, mm, I don't know about this. So when you're not around, they people can create a narrative for you and say, Oh, you, you must not be around because you can't afford it. Instead of saying, ask me what, I need to you to understand. And that's another thing we talked about is giving a person permission and asking, even with your students, an improvisation. What do you think? This gives you an opportunity to, to say, you know, be your own person. And I think that's what a lot of, you know, might be going off on a tangent. Organizations miss. They don't, if they feel like you're just doing this to save face, but you really don't care to hear me in the first place. Mm -hmm. And this is, so we're translating this to not only inviting teachers, but to also our students to let them know that same thing that you do matter. You have a voice. And the more I support you, the more you're going to grow to become a change maker and a change leader of the future with innovation, imagination, creativity, music and i love when we say um healing is in us and music is the what is it? what music is the catalyst or the thing that helps us to extract that healing mm -hmm. is music yeah um, that's that's what you're I want. gonna make up your own phrase for this because <laughs> that one came off like the the goddess oracle cards like tarot cards that i had <laughs> It's one of these things. I don't know. <laughs> I always pull it though. That's the one that grabs it. It's in the gems. Yes. So yeah. And then the fundraising part, that was deep. That was a well, good. Let, let me ask you a little bit more of something you touched on Karen, so they can get a, a tangible thing that you are using in your own personal teaching scenario to practice inclusivity and also nurture change maker skill of 
innovation and using your imagination, which is actually like a higher order thinking skill that is the opposite of memorizing stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like creating new knowledge. Mm -hmm. And Karen is doing that with zero to five year olds is inviting <laughs> them to create new knowledge. Like you're smart enough to create new knowledge. Um, and how are you, how are you practicing that, that practice of inclusion in your class? Um, well, we have a lot, we do parent education moments as a part of our class work and improvisation is what I've been using lately with the, even the parents, because the more we practice as parents, the more we invite our little ones to see us and where they're models. And so they, they do it and then they encourage the children. And then when the children do it, they support them by doing it with them too. So I just encourage, and then the whole class. So when a child sings or hums or does a tonal pattern or does any little thing, we're going to do it too. Let's sing together and support um, Charlotte. Let's sing with Charlotte and we support Charlotte with what she did and it helps encourage her to not be afraid to improv the next time because she feels mm -hmm. supported. So I think that would be my inclusivity thing to have yeah. us get together and do it together. Even when a parent does it, I'm like, let's do that again. You know? yeah. So the call and response isn't just like, you doing the call and then responding you're allowing like inviting the kids and parents to be oh, yeah. the caller and then you respond and repeat after them and validate that and the the improvising is the teaching practice that where they practice innovation it's like yeah. that's a tangible thing you can do if you want to nurture your kids with the skill of innovation and help them develop that you need like a way for them to do it and, and having them improvise is one of the ways that we use and Karen uses um and I know this because um I'm in her class with my kids my three and a half year olds there's tonal patterns that they do in the class like ba 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 and they're on the cds that you listen to so whenever Karen hears a kid in the class just make up their own, she'll have the whole class repeat after that kid. Mm -hmm. um, and just reinforce, yes, so we want wrong. you to make up your own stuff because it's just as valid as whatever I'm singing that's from the book or whatever, or from the, the recording. It's just as valid when you're making up your own stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. super fun. And the reason <laughs> for that, why, why do we need kids to have the skill of innovation as for the, for their future is because, um, they're the future creators, the future change leaders, change makers, critical thinkers that, that helps with, mm -hmm their critical thinking skills. They can think on how to do something for themselves. They can take risks through innovation, you know, improvisation. Um, they won't be led, that's less, less likely to be led in fear. Uh, if you know you can do it and you have confidence to do it, and then it just, for the next time, you just mm -hmm. get more and more courage yeah. to, to, you know, speak out and do it on your own. And then a lot of parents, sometimes they're like, oh, they're shy, they're cautious. No, they don't say cautious. I say, well, cautious is good. And then two, sometimes we're audiating and thinking. You don't always have to be Johnny on the spot. Allow them to, you know, right now they're just thinking and then later on they'll, and then they're, they're like, oh, at home they sing, but in class, they, I'm like, that's what they're supposed to do. You know, and I'm like, well, math and science is one thing, but what is it without imagination? Mm -hmm. How many inventions can we actually come up with? Yeah. See how important imagination is. 
Yeah, because we're trying to get them to solve white supremacist capitalist patriarchy and change it. It's like they really need innovation. That's one of the skills they really need. And they need a bunch more. And we are going to intentionally get them to nurture these because we, we're trying to win against white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Like, that's part of my purpose of teaching. It's pretty much my whole purpose of teaching. <laughs> and doing that through violin, it turns out. <laughs> um, but we that's why we're all here is because we all agree with that and we want to be serious about it and make our plans and win so i put in the chat uh some of the other change maker skills that we talked about trying to nurture in our students um and each of the gems picked out one or three of their favorite ones and their homework was to come up with how am I going to do this in my private lessons or in my group classes how am I going to specifically help the kids develop these one or the ones that I think are most important for my kids in my city in my studio knowing them personally and all of their intersectional identities um so thank you Karen for sharing about your your teaching yeah. scenario and it's really cool to have a music together teacher you're, you're my first music together teacher and i hope i get tons more Yay. Um, and i'm a music together teacher too and a suzuki teacher so i think both really draw some great people <laughs> who and the curriculums are great and fit really they fit in with our social justice viewpoints it we just need to like come up with the wording and commit to it all right so let's hear from someone else our next person's not from detroit she's from holland michigan and her name is Lauren Garza. Welcome, Lauren. Hi. Can Hi. you tell us how long you've been teaching and your teaching scenario and also any demographics about your students generally that you'd want to share? Sure. I am in Holland, Michigan. I wish I was in Detroit. <laughs> Can I say that? Um, now I'm from Holland and I have a private studio of violin and viola students and I've been teaching for about 15 years and currently I teach at a local church that is a historically black church and in the city and they have a very diverse um, congregation and missional outreach and my uh let's see hopes and dreams and goals for my studio fit very well with theirs and so it's a beautiful relationship and partnership and my students i have also a piano component to my studio um which another teacher teaches the piano part but um yeah, so my students range from five years old to like 17 years old and they get weekly lessons. And yeah, that. <laughs> Yay. I, yeah, I currently have two, well, two scholarship students in my studio and two piano scholarship students. And, and I'd like that to be, I have a goal for free to teach them. <laughs> right. So before this, I've right been teaching for free. Right now, my model has been um, my way of making it equitable and accessible for students mm -hmm. and reaching the students that I want to reach has to make, volunteer my time, decided how many hours I could volunteer. I used to have like five scholarship students. And before I met Clara, or when I found Clara, it was always at the back of my head that I would like to eventually be paid for my time, but it wasn't gonna stop me from doing my teaching. So for the past five years, my, the program I currently have is called Harmony Scholars. Um, 
it's about five years old and we've been evolving and growing and this gems was the next step in learning how to grow and be sustainable which the fundraising and the money part to me never um, translated into sustainability and I really see that after this course that that is a big piece as much as I have been putting it off or have been bringing my own thoughts about money into it <laughs> um, I've learned a lot about how to look at this um, in terms of the fundraising and in terms of the income and the money and um, the importance of that I'm still it's probably I, one of my harder things that it's going to take me longer to work through that part, <laughs> which I've been open with with Clara. But um, in terms of the course, I think the one thing that really stuck with me, they kind of three, they're intertwined for me, inclusion, studio culture, and equity pedagogy. I get really pumped up about, and I keep going back to those lessons, and those I think are going to be my top three like someone else said before we started, it's going to take a lot of time to process all that we've learned, all the resources that you've shared with us, all the ideas that we've shared together and come up with and really make it personal to, which is the point, which to our studio and our community. Um, that's the other thing I really loved about this was how to um, embrace who I am, where I am, the students that I have, the joy of influencing, teaching, doing life with, the families, and in the bigger picture in our community, um, that was kind of central to this. It wasn't like you have to do it this way. It was well, where are you, and what? Who are who are you a part of, <laughs> and how do you reach them? Um, yeah, in an authentic way, which is what I really love. And so that's why I liked the studio, the um, the studio vision story um, has really inspired me. And I, I just go back to that when I'm looking for what I'm going to do next or looking for guidance, I guess, like this is what I want. And this is how do I create a space that reflects this? How do I create experiences for my students that reflect this? Um, in terms of like the place-based learning that we talked about when it comes to inclusion. Um, and then the equity pedagogy, that's another big one that I really, I haven't figured out exactly how to address all those. Um, I know we are supposed to pick one. Mine was purposefulness. I think I have three. Purposefulness, curiosity, and collaboration. Um, yeah, there's just so much information. Like I, I, I am still, I'm sorry if I'm not like verbally expressing it all <laughs> coherently, but um, there's just so much that I'm excited about that I'm still trying to piece together and figure out what I'm gonna focus on first, but mm -hmm. with that. <laughs> yes, good job. <laughs> Uh, yes so the studio vision was taking a little amount of time and just writing down like what in the first person what it would look like a year from now in your studio that where one in which reflects your social justice values more clearly and everyone wrote one and shared it and that was like our greater why we figured out and then we started filling in the steps towards that in the different categories of how am i going to diversify it how am i going to make it accessible how am i going to make it inclusive how am i going to use equity pedagogy and or like what are you already doing that that can be rephrased and you can learn to come up with some talking points to say i'm already doing group class and that nurtures collaboration that's equity pedagogy um sarah's here another uh former gem um so that was one of the things that we did the first week was that uh vision story for your your ideal 
classroom that you want to walk into and feel like I love this studio and I fucking made this for myself. And that's for me. And also it helps the children. (laughs) That's what I'm trying to get across to everyone is like, this is about you too. And the, and people talking about self care and what's sustainable and will go in the long run for, for you. And then also, help you impact the children the most so yes yes. so one of lauren's plans is to with the grassroots fundraising is to um cover those two students that she's currently volunteering to teach as part of her like effort to make it sustainable and replicable as a model because we're we all are also seeing ourselves as like okay we're growing equitable music studios and we want other people to see us as a model that they can replicate and if we're saying yeah you just volunteer and you just like don't get to feed your kids and drive a shitty car like no one wants to join that party (laughs) and not everyone can is the other thing is like do we want this all to just be privileged rich white people who can do this i never thought about it that way but that is so true yeah that's just another i know and that's the thing like this is just open my eyes the conversation another reason that i took the course was to meet other people who have the similar vision and goal for themselves and their studios and it's just been awesome because it can feel really lonely when you feel especially in a small community you know people support you but they don't know, you know, they just don't understand, or you just don't have anyone to talk to or really, I don't know. So I love, besides wanting to move to Detroit. <laughs> yeah. So I love that part. Of the, yeah. <laughs> the weekly conversations. And the, the other part I did write down was the self-care and the administrative tools. Um, mm. that were, they were really more impactful than I thought it was going to be just and how to prioritize and vision like you aren't you aren't telling us to do it next week you're like okay wait that's fall of 2022 (laughs) you know like it's very realistic and honest and um doable manageable and yeah so thank you (laughs) yay (laughs) thank you for trusting me yeah (laughs) so that's yeah today yes Yes. awesome does anyone have any specific questions for lauren i saw shanoa hey we can meet on monday during this time (laughs) now that this is done (laughs) i'm free on monday at 1 30. i was happy to see maybe she's not here anymore but she is no i'm here oh monday let's meet (laughs) no that Um, was no my time yeah let's do it let's do it Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I had a question. Mm -hmm. Um, I was curious about the place-based learning, if you could say a tiny bit about that. Okay. Well, maybe Clara wants to say a tiny bit more on place-based learning, but in my take on place-based learning, it's more like collaborate. Think of it as collaborating, like with a local artist and share your skills. So if I'm thinking like super local, I don't think Claire heard about this idea, but I have a ukulele teacher that wants to offer a ukulele class and needs a space. And then I have fiddle tunes and we're gonna try and fit together. Like my violin and viola kids can play their fiddle tunes while the ukulele kids learn chords. So they're learning, uh, yeah, it's collaborative. It's learning a different musical style. It's learning from others. And then the symphony has a mariachi concert coming up in the summer. And I'm going to try and figure out how we could do something with that. Stuff like that. Like Gems has done a lot of really neat things. Yeah, she just put something in the chat, so that might help. (laughs) Those are really exciting ideas. And I'm reading the chat. Thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah, it doesn't have to be local. I mean, also I was connected with Shanoa in offering a class um, 
on black composers, classical black composers. Um, we just haven't gotten the date, but that's the plan. <laughs> which I think is place-based. I don't know, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but. I think the idea is to, with the place-based learning is um, to personalize it to each person's city and what is historically significant to your city um, in terms of musical genres. And then by celebrating those genres, it's developing a positive cultural identity in your specific students as citizens of that city um and also it, for my studio with detroit youth volume it was also to develop positive cultural identity in my students as youth of color because it was like the majority of my students um so i would be intentional about collaborating with people who looked like them as the people who are in power in the classroom uh, in positions of power and leaders um, so that they could be proud of who they are does anyone else want to share anything about their place-based education project Christian. So one of the things that um, I wanted to work on and I work on in general with my students is um, being confident in our playing. And so one of the things that my hope is to do in the next year or two is to be able to work with people who perform violin or whatever instrument in like the uh, rock or pop setting so that we can talk about stage presence. Mm -hmm. So one of the, my hope is that, because one of the things that we don't get to really talk about as classical musicians is how when you walk on stage, that's your stage. And so my hope is there are a few musicians who I actually know, like uh, Candace Smith who runs around. She literally just played, uh, at uh, the Pistons uh, halftime show for their opening night. Um, <laughs> and um, there are a few others in the area who are amazing musicians and you don't really hear about them, but also when you go and play pop tunes at weddings or whatever you play your pop tunes, you have to play it like you're a rock star. You can't <laughs> play it like you're a little student who can hold their instrument. You gotta play it, you gotta own it. So my goal is to just work on stage presence with the students, but also bring in artists who are local to the community to actually talk about what that means as a performer. Mm -hmm. And the different genres that, that we choose, we're trying to get the kids to learn to play their instrument in the style of whatever genre it is right so and christian was telling me earlier today about how the stage presence piece and developing that also develops their the change maker skill of optimism and hope and right. belief that the best possible outcome is attainable um so he's got a teaching practice built in there yeah with the genre you can, and you can. <laughs> And then when some people were choosing the genre of jazz and seeing that innovation is a big change maker skill you can d develop through jazz with improv. Um, so you can ch pick out little things that are special to that genre that resonate with you in terms of the change maker skills too. Thank you, Christian. Okay, Lauren P is next from Ann Arbor. Welcome, Lauren. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Pulsifer. I'm a teacher in a violin teacher in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I um, I've been teaching. I guess I've been teaching since high school, but I feel like I've really been teaching for the past 
three years, like kind of as my main job. <laughs> and I, um, I'm kind of in the process or I'm, you know, I can see it as like a definitely a continuing process, um, which is what is so exciting about teaching, but I'm sort of in the process right now of just sort of be making that feel like a comfortable form of income for me, for myself and making that kind of my main job. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting there with that. Um, I feel like I've done like, you know, as a like performance person in, in college, I didn't really get a ton of t of um, training in teaching. And I feel like I've been trying and um, working through like different courses and, and trying to continue my education with teaching um, since I graduated. And I've, I've learned so much about my instrument through that process, but I also have felt like up until this course, I haven't had something that like has a bigger why to it like I've all my courses have been very focused on the bow hold or on how to hold your instrument which is great I want to know about how to teach that but I also have so appreciated having a course I feel like it's for me coming at a really good time of just like but what am I actually doing this for um and I, I think a little bit about my background, something I shared um, in the first day is that I was a performance major, but I went through a performance injury. And I um, that's part of what really drew me to teaching was just like really the um, feeling of wanting to help students to not go through that same thing. <laughs> and I, I was sort of reflecting on how like for me, I think a lot of that comes from just the anxiety of a studio, like how, how I've had a lot of experiences in the past that have just made me feel very anxious in a teaching studio and I want to create a space that feels safe for my students to explore and mm -hmm. um so that's been my kind of my my why that I've that I've been wanting to get more clarity on how to make that actually happen um and I think one of the things I got I I got the most out of among so many things um but was the like as everyone has, has been mentioning the sustainability aspect of it because I feel like I've been doing so much work for so long that I felt like it was just like a rite of passage like I have to, I just have to do all this in order to in order to build my studio and I have to just spend hours emailing parents for free and I have to spend I have to be teaching out of like um, you know, I currently don't really have a centralized location for my studio. I, I feel like I'm teaching all over the place and I want to create a space that feels like mine where I can have my vision and my goals very clearly, um, or like just, just my, my, uh, studio culture very clearly stated when you walk in the room, um, is a big kind of long-term goal for me. Um, and um, so just getting the, the idea, like the day that Clara was talking about paying yourself for the administrative work, what you do that, like bl my brain exploded. Like I never, I never thought, of I had never, I was just like, that is, that's just part of it. Like they're paying for that, right? Like when you, when you pay for lessons, that's what you're paying for. You're paying for all this extra stuff that I'm doing. And I realized like how many, I've started to keep track of like how many hours per week I spend emailing and how I have a hard time not just responding to an email immediately. I don't really have like time set aside for myself where I'm dedicating that like office hours. And I'm just, I'm just on call all the time. You know, I'm, I'm, I have a hard time setting boundaries because I want them to get the information as soon as possible because I just feel like that's my job. <laughs> but it, it's not something I can sustain forever. I need to have boundaries with that. I need to have um, hours set aside for work and hours set aside for taking care of myself. And I can make money doing this. Like I can have it be sustainable in terms of income as you know, a recent college graduate, basically. It's not, it's not been that long since I was in school and I'm still kind of building that part of my myself and feeling established as a as a person like getting kind of settled more um and so all of those things were just um, in, such an incredible um 
came at such a great time for me in terms of just really um, realizing that all of that is a part of the activism work that I hope to do in my studio. Um, and it's okay to want to take that time for yourself and it's okay to want to get paid for the work that you're doing and to provide for students. Um, and that if you're do if you're not getting paid to do that, then you're not going to put in as much um, necessarily. I mean, you know, I, for me, I, I you know, I'm not maybe going to put in as much if I, if I'm doing it for free or um, so, so all of that was just incredible. That part of it really, um, I think is the thing that stuck with me the most, um, just the getting organized aspect of everything. And so I think my tangible, my next tangible step is like getting myself organized as much as possible, being, creating clear expectations for families when they come in and making sure that they know what they're signing up for. Um, I've spent a lot of time getting frustrated for, you know, spending energy on being frustrated for things that I maybe haven't never clarified. Like I just assumed people would know that you have to practice every day if you're in a studio, <laughs> if, you're in, if you're taking lessons. Cause you know, it's like you think about the kids are in a lot of extracurriculars where that's not the case. Like they're showing up weekly and that's it. They show up to that one thing and they don't have to go home and consistently play soccer every day. Maybe they do, but they don't have to in order to be a part of that. But for a studio, it's it's my job as a teacher to explain that to students. And it's not just something that um, people will know. And um, also just, just making sure that, um, you know, I, I'm, really in communication with parents because that is something that I struggle with. I struggle to be clear with parents. I think I'm, I'm good at communicating with the students, but I think talking with parents and making sure I have information sessions and I have the handbook and I have all of that stuff. Like this is all part of creating that equitable music studio that I want to have because I need to have something that I'm not focusing my energy on frustrations that I can clarify for people and um, that I'm also providing myself the resources that I need in order to, to do this. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, and then I think another aspect was just making like the group learning. Um, I mean, as of right now, my teaching scenario, which I guess I didn't mention um, fully is that I am a, I, I teach all of my own students. I don't work for a school. I, I am a self-run studio and I have a lot of control over what I do in my studio, which is awesome. I feel I have, I'm very lucky in that way where I feel like I can create my own culture within um, my studio, but it's like knowing where to start in doing that. And one thing is just realizing how important the group aspect of it is, because as of right now, I offer group classes weekly, but they're not required. They're, they're sort of like, if you want to come to group class, you can, but um, making that, how important that is because um, group lessons are where a lot of times that community aspect is built and where those workshops that we've, those place-based workshops that we've talked about in the course can happen and where we can do the improvisation um, activities together. Um, one of which I heard from a friend recently that I loved um, that I want to try is converse, conversational improv where you like have kids talk, um, to simulate, I guess, different like types of conversations. Like, you know, one example is um, people having a conversation where two people keep interrupting each other versus talking back and forth versus like one person talking and everyone and, and somebody else is listening, doing that with instruments. Um, and involving the parents, maybe by having the parents have the conversation, like have say, say words to the kid and have the kid like respond with their instrument. Like I, all of these things are so cool. And I, but I need to have that group aspect in order to make that happen. Um, <laughs> it's so funny. It's like, you have so many thoughts. And then when you start talking, you start to, I, I start to go off on so many different 
<laughs> oh, you just gave us a totally tangible teaching practice for improv, which develops innovation in our students, which is a change maker skill. So Great. I'm trying to put it in the chat, what you said. <laughs> Great. I, I'm trying to keep track of if I've covered the, the questions. I want to ask you um, oh. to go. Okay. Do you have one more thing? Go for it. <laughs> um, I put the definition of studio culture in the chat because people are probably like, what are you talking about? Um, and it is just a set of known values like um, and it dictates how people understand they are to behave and feel inside your classroom. And it also can dictate how the organization functions and the choices that you make when you're managing it. And so when you were talking about having your own space where you can have control over the studio culture, like with, with aesthetics, can you share a couple of the ways that you imagine doing that aesthetically in your classroom? Yeah. Um, kind of, this was all, this was a big part of my vision statement from the start, but um, having it be a place where like there is a place where people can um, get ready for their lesson. Right now, I don't have that. I, I have, you know, people have to wait outside before their lesson and come in and then the lesson gets started and there's really not a place for them to unpack and to take, take stock of how they're feeling. And I'm feeling, I'm imagining like having a room where there's like a list or a sign that says like, have you taken a deep breath lately? And like, here are some stretches you can do. And all of these, you know, things that just get you mentally prepared to walk into a lesson space versus just sort of being thrown into it. Um, so that's huge. Um, just having that space, having a space for, um, you know, different types of families that show up, like families with sibling, uh, ki kids with siblings, where the, maybe the parent isn't able to have childcare for the other kids during the lesson time. And I want to have activities for those kids. I want to have um, place, places for them to uh, be during the lesson so that the parent can, or the whoever adult is there, can then be engaged with mm -hmm. the lesson. Because um, that's a privilege to be able to have, to be able to show up and be the sole person there with your kid. Um, and I want to have, like, on my walls, I'm just picturing, like, different art and and uh, like quotes and uh, that just reflect like composers and musicians of like all different genders and colors and just you know it's so exciting to think about you know having a space where I, and like having my like goals on the wall mm -hmm. and I just I just see that as such an important part of that the lesson space itself is just like showing up to a place where you feel like you're your um, ideals are are reflected just in the physical space you're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then one of the other things that in, that you can have in the sibling area or the waiting area were, are books that have all the values that you believe in. Yeah. Right. And and um, Clara, you even shared some some books. Um, one of the weeks that that art would be good for a studio space so like I think I don't know I don't remember exactly the titles right now but I, I wrote all those down and like <laughs> books yeah you know, it's just yeah if yeah. it's like if you're if you want to support LGBTQ families like have representation in the books that you have in your studio it's like a tangible little thing that you can just do and then you're like I love all these books in here they totally I'm so about them and I want to share with the kids and the parents and I want people to be drawn to my studio who are into these books. That's the other thing is like you are trying to draw people into your studio that will make you feel seen as who you really are, but you have to like tell them who you are first for them to know. <laughs> Um, so we talked about like changing up your bio and maybe not having it list so many of the people that you studied with 
in college <laughs> and having it list some of the other life experiences that you have or, or like straight up like I am a social justice activist and my studio is one of the tools that I use to bring about um, social change in the world. Um, because putting that kind of stuff in there is what has made Detroit Youth Volume like um, so successful. And it's half full scholarship students and half tuition payers. And I want, and um, Karen was bringing this up too, that the point that like not all this, the tuition payers are going to be like, just white people who are rich like there's rich black families that drive from the suburbs into detroit to come to my studio because they want the environment that's there and even though and it's like they live next door to another one that isn't intentional about the classroom makeup and creating a socioeconomically diverse classroom because that actually benefits all the kids regardless of their background um, so putting, putting all those values in, in your bio so that people can choose you and you can be with the people who want to be with you. <laughs> so thank you, Lauren, um, for sharing about that and Thor is leaving. Bye, Thor. Bye-bye. See you later. Talk to you soon. Uh, are there any other questions for for Lauren right now? All right. I just want to say, <clears throat> Lauren, I am so happy and, and proud of you for, you know, you, you helped me a lot through this class a couple times with verbiage and just just your perspective on things and just everybody in the class has just been great to hear your your way of thinking and how you want it your your studio to develop especially with you know the the time span that you've been doing what you're doing your age and all that good stuff um that's that's good you, you have a really uh, i'm feeling what you're where you're going with this Likewise, Karen. <laughs> I feel the same way about you and about everybody. That's the other great thing about this course is it's such a community builder and you get a chance to actually talk to not only, you know, hear from Clara and what DYV has been up to, but also like mm -hmm. all of these other amazing teachers <laughs> and all it, like all of you. I just feel like so I'm going to miss seeing everybody. <laughs> Me too. Me too. This is like, this is like group class. <laughs> We're all collaborating, practicing collaboration <laughs> in a non-hierarchical fashion, in emergence, emergent strategy, like starlings flying around. I have to go by. Hi, Sarah. Okay. I've got so much out of one half hour with you guys that it's just amazing. <laughs> Thank oh, you very okay. much. <laughs> Sarah was in the last cohort too. Um, she's one of she's a professor. Okay, so let's hear from Michael. And I always thought. It was because of my age that I was going last. That's your first name is an M. <laughs> I didn't realize it was my first name. I thought, oh, I'm just the old guy. They're just saying me for the end. <laughs> yeah, I was like, let me put the white guy last. Let yeah, make exactly. Sense. <laughs> old white guy for the end. Let's, Let's turn things on its head. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'm Michael Germanis, and I've been playing the. I've been teaching for. Um, about 30 years now and I um, also for about the first 25 years of my career I would 
concertize all around the world with my piano trio. We'd tour all over. And so I'd be teaching as well. I'd give master classes. I'd have students, not all around the world. Let me just say, no. The US, Europe, and Asia. So okay. that's where we went. That, okay, certainly not all around the world. And, um, which, uh, but it, it, it brought a lot of perspective to me in my, um, in my world, in my world of being a classical uh, white violinist. And so, but I've been teaching for 30 years now. And um, I, uh, so in about the past 10 years, I've been involved in a program called Music for Everyone. Uh, actually, we're, I think it's now about 12 years. Um, and so that is my, um, it's kind of my main gig where uh, we go provide music in the community of Lancaster, um, the, the music schools, and the, the s public schools there. We help supplement their education. Now we also have an after school program. I also have a small private studio and I teach uh, as an adjunct. I've been doing this for about 30 years as well at Franklin and Marshall College. So, um, so that's, those I think are the, the three. Th so there's kind of like Christian, I, I have a lot of, um, you know, various, various um, pots boiling at the same time and they, and they tend to intertwine themselves. So, so that, and when I heard about Clara's course, Gems, I, I immediately wanted to uh, reach out because actually I was in the process of trying to figure out uh, a new curriculum myself. And I know we had spoken about that in the very beginning of our meeting because I, I was just so fed up with all this. Um, well, I was teaching for about 20, 25 years in the same old role model, preparing kids for auditions, preparing kids for conservatory. So, um, and then recognizing the breakdown in um, all the, the white supremacy characteristics that are in there and, um, and trying to filter through. So, so that's my journey. <laughs> um, and this has been incredible working with all of you um, and I just love what, what I've been learning. And right now my dog is crying at my door. I'm sorry about that. But, um, but I think the thing that I really gravitated to uh, is the, um, the equitable pedagogy. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I don't know if it's possible, but um, because my, my stepson, Go get your dog. Go, get, go let the dog in. I think the dog came in. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> But my dog, so now the room's going to start smelling bad because he's 15 years old. But <laughs> we don't need to say anymore. But Jake is in the house. I know that. Um, so the equitable pedagogy just resonated so much, especially since I'm kind of formulating this curriculum or anti-curriculum, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, so I loved it. And I've loved everything about the class and also about, you know, the idea of raising fundraising and just, um, yeah, it, it was all really great. So I, I took a lot of notes, <laughs> but my, my stepson actually put together a slideshow to help organize me. So if you could make me a co-host, can I oh, just help? Yeah. It, it'll help me out. It'll probably, okay. you know, How be a little bit of a, do this? you know, that it'll kind so of cool. change the vision of the screen. And so I'll go through it and I'll explain a few things. So I can't make you, I'm just going to make you the host. So okay. don't Got leave it. at the end and tell everyone. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh yeah. I better. Oh my gosh. Okay. I could end the whole damn thing yeah, right here. Don't leave. Okay. No, I won't do that. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. And, okay. and this is actually was really an inspiration. Um, even the, the, the title of who I'm now thinking I'm going to brand myself as. Um, okay. It's all kind of intertwined. So, um, so this has really been thanks to you, Clara, and everyone else in this class. Um, so this is just a little slideshow, though, to put it all in perspective. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Can you see it? Yes. Okay, now hold on. I'm gonna. Oh, go to nice the colors. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> that wasn't me. Let me just see. I'm gonna go to the slideshow. 
All right, and I'm, I am awful at this. I think one of my colleagues is on the call, Mr. Woodson, and he <laughs> knows that I sometimes need to be bailed out, and I will stop this. If it, so equitably, equitable pedagogy with Dr. Germanis, the holistic violinist. Okay. So this is, the holistic violinist is what I have um, thought might be a good name for, because I like to incorporate the, the body as the instrument. Yeah. That is my instrument that are that and that is what I want to promote to my students. Mm -hmm. And um, so the I'm going to go on to the next slide, but it's not allowing me to. Uh oh. Oh, music is connection. OK, and now I say my studio is the world. These are some of the students that I've worked with. Uh, some of my students and this is a um, and that's my beautiful vibrational connection, uh, vibrational frequency connector wife right there, and some <laughs> of the faculty members up here with music for everyone and some of the students. That, and why I say my studio is a world is because Lancaster, actually, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a strange city in that it actually is the largest per capita um, uh, refugee population in America. So um, one class that I was giving at uh, a middle school last year had seven kids in it, and they were all from different countries. So it was, it was kind of bringing a lot of perspective into um, equitable music studios. Uh, and highlights of what I have found to be helpful and equitable pedagogy. So the breath, incorporating breath in my, um, in my teachings, um, and sound bath. We'll go into this too. And, and repertoire. Now I've included the name repertoire. Music choices. Repertoire is a little high, high end for me. Um, and I would love to, at the end, we'll figure out maybe a better name for it. But um, the breath, I'd like to start by going into that and what I because just recently I've started incorporating all of these into my various studios that I teach at and what it does to make the student be present in themselves and not feel like they have to come here and be a different person so mm -hmm. so for me I know every time I move my cursor you see a little thing I'm a doodger and my dog is crying right now, so now I don't know what. Hold on. I just I love the idea, the holistic violinist, and thinking about the body as the instrument because it kind of points to it's not the violin oh, or the cello or the flute that's important. It's the individual, and that feels like a practice of inclusivity to me and developing that in your own in your studio culture. Like it's each individual that I want to know about and I care about right, helping right. them learn to breathe better and feel better in their body and their, in their reality and their environment. Cause this and is everyone their... is the product of their environment, right? Right. So yeah. you're starting out that environment of the lesson with breathing. Right. right? And you know, I've been breathing for 30 years, I didn't realize what I was doing, though. Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm going to tell a little story. In 1989, my audition for my master's program, I was nervous as hell, playing all this crazy ass rep. And I was at Yale University. And I was just like, oh, it was, you know, a bundle of nerves. And, and the, the pianist who was accompanying me, he was very, he, he was like, off the charts, mature, all, played with all these people. Luckily, he suggested just bend over, relax, and just you know, hang your arms and breathe and keep breathing. And don't come up, just stay down there. And, he, and I said, oh my God, this is taking forever. I gotta get going. I gotta play my violin, my violin. You know, that kind of thing. But I didn't, I stayed with it. I stayed with it. And when I, and I played that audition, I'll never forget it because I nailed it. I didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. I was. I was like, okay. And, but I didn't realize it was 
yes, I gave that credit and I would only use that type of breathing when I would be performing like concerts that might be, you know, big, high end, ego, ri ego driven concerts where I was so concerned about the critic in the audience or something like that. And then I would do that. So I didn't realize how much I could develop it and put it into my daily practice mm -hmm. um, until 2018. <laughs> and I did a, a, a workshop and we started doing belly breathing and we did conscious breath and I do it on a daily basis. And now I think now we are actually doing it with um, both the after school program. I do it in my private studio. I do it with my students at FNM. And you know, the kids like from fourth grade to college, they, it, they're, it helps them just be, be present. And I remember my vision statement in the very beginning that Clara, you had us right. I said, my ideal studio is that everyone would hold space for transformation at the beginning, which is kind of coming present and shedding yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's all revolved around breathing. And it enables them, I find it, it enables me and my students to be present with who they are. They don't have to be someone else when they come into the mm -hmm. lesson. They are themselves. They, they don't have to compromise who they are. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, be like, it's like telling them you're worthy enough not to just go through life in flight or flight mode. And yeah. I'm going to teach you a real practice that you can use to get out of that mode so that you can like find your own sound eventually. Because <laughs> right. how are they going to do that if they're just nervous about trying to be perfect at right. something else somebody else's yeah. stuff yeah i had one kid who came in yesterday he had a milkshake and three kit kats and it was, it was he was nuts bouncing off the wall he did some breathing followed by a sound bath and it was amazing i'm gonna go to the sound because i love sound baths and this is something that i just discovered at a racial justice from the heart retreat in Georgia in September that my beautiful frequency partner, mate, wife, Dr. Amanda Kemp was leading. And um, we, so one of the parts was, um, they asked me to play the viola and this woman led the sound bath and I was just kind of infusing it. And she had these big singing bowls and had a soundtrack but then I saw the, the reaction that the people had. I mean, I was moved, but the people experiencing it were like, and this was on Zoom, so people from around the country were experiencing it. They weren't even feeling the actual vibrations. I guess maybe they were. I don't know how the whole transmission of stuff works, but, but then I started doing this with my, my students, and we do it actually on a daily basis. Um, and it, I think it really makes them, well, I'm the, the one, one person had told me, well, you know, you're three quarters water or liquid, your body. So what those vibrations are doing to your body, think about, think about it because it's really making, it's, a, it's making you who you really are. That, that, so it's attuning your body to become the instrument. Because basically when you think about, okay, getting back to teaching bow hold, well, what's the bow hold? It's our body. It's not me holding the bow. It's me. It's how my hand is, you know, it's our body. So we got to make them aware of what is their body and, and the sound bath. Like I'll tell them, I say, Hey, you know, raise your arms because so many kids, when you ask them to raise their hand, they go like this, but raise your arms up high and we are going to bathe those <laughs> armpits with the safety of beautiful vibrations. And it's so eco-friendly. <laughs> Can you explain like what is it? Because yeah. when you talked about it a couple of weeks ago, I was like, I don't know. I'm not cool enough to know what this is. I've heard it once or twice. Right. Well, <laughs> but okay, it's so like a practice of improvising with long drones. Yes. Yes. And right? and usually it's so you know we'll start on the G string, the D string. We might play add another note, but it's it re and it really helps the kids warm up as well. Mm -hmm. So, and we usually stand in a circle. We stand in a circle 
and we start. We just start playing, and some of the kids may not start right away. They might just try. I I usually I I usually lead off, and then they kind of bit by bit chime in, and then we have this sound going, and and I might change a note randomly, and someone else might change a note because they they get inspired that okay any sound will work it doesn't have to be 538 megahertz exactly you know it'll <laughs> work it's a vibration and and some of the acoustic like we we now work in the sanctuary space which is awesome and the kids are feeling it and the other thing when they're in the circle then i'll i'll kind of direct them slightly i'll say now let's go play for so and so and that person will stop playing and we're all playing the drones for that person oh, wow. and they'll just be there and so they're receiving it mm -hmm. you know and what's awesome is it's sound that's what it is you could have you could have you know black brown white they're being like they're they're being played for they're receiving it mm -hmm. they're learning how to receive and and by learning how to receive they're also learning how to give because I don't think you can really give until you know how to receive. I think it's that kind of simpatico mm -hmm. um, feeling. So that that's something that that I've, I've yeah, that is been a huge part of the incorporating into my teaching now. And that's oh. and that's a practice of inclusivity, right, too? Yes. Like, because yes. inclusivity, you're like, it's hard to wrap our minds around, like, what, how do you actually do that in a lesson or a group class? Here's a way. <laughs> and we uh, just have to, like, put a few of these together, and then we feel so good about ourselves that we're really doing it. And you can do it during group class. It's yeah, not going to be an extra weight. And I had a practice. I had this uh, yogi reverend that I've worked with who leads us in breathing meditations. He came here to do a recording with me, and I had him to my Franklin and Marshall class. I wanted him to go further, but we couldn't bring him all around. But so we did the sound bath first, then we did the breathing meditation, then we did another sound bath. And we went around and asked everyone mm. what they felt. And the level of awareness within their bodies was so f much more heightened. It was, and the actual sound, you could hear a difference the second time. Mm. It was just a whole different level of depth. It was wild. So the combination of the two are just like, takes, takes people with, deep within themselves. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the better the bow hold, the better the <laughs> sound they're going to pull, but whatever, you know, it's right. what it is. And, and then the third thing, because I really wanted to implement three um, changes in my um, uh, classroom is, oh, now let's see, I have this thing in the way, I don't know how to make it disappear. Oh, oh repertoire. Can you read repertoire? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so now this one, I, leaning into appreciation rather than appropriation, importance of self-awareness for incorporating an equitable repertoire. So yeah, I really think uh, no matter how, um, you know, and I, I may be preaching to the choir in this audience, but I, I think this is something that, yeah, you can say it all you want, you can talk the talk all you want, but this requires deep equitable tr equity training. I think to go deep and, and not just say, okay, I'm gonna you know, put some black composers in here for you. And, because I think it, there's, there's a fine line between appreciation and appropriation. And even for me, who, and I've, even for me, well, yeah, of course for me, cause I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm a white guy raised in white supremacy culture. So yes, of course for me, not even for me. But, um, but I've done a lot of equity training, uh, but it's still there. And so when, like last February, I, I programmed a series, it happened to be on Beethoven. I was playing the concert and I thought, oh, I got a little bit of a um, nudge, say, hey, by the way, it's Black History Month. I said, oh, well, let's tie in Bridge Tower. You know, we'll play the Kreutzer Sonata and dedicate it to Bridge Tower instead of Beethoven. 
great. Black has been accomplished. Well, yeah, that's appropriation. Damn it. Mm. And then I thought, but I don't mean it that way. Well, okay, let's go a step further. Let's donate proceeds to Christmas Addicts Community Center. Let's appreciate the black community center in our community. And let's also put on the play by Rita Dove on Bridge Tower. So we went a little further into that. And then also mm -hmm. things like for my studio teaching, I have, um, I've, I've reached out to various living composers, like a Chinese American activist, jazz saxophonist, who also played the violin, who's an amazing composer, to write some uh, solo violin pieces. I reached out to a, a black uh, woman composer from uh, Birmingham, Alabama. She's now in Richmond to write some pieces for violin and for chamber music. And so, and then also the idea of when I'm asked to conduct at uh, various uh, festivals, I'll program black composers. I'll call for Judy Still and say, hey, and suggest. But also the idea of teaching technique. Now I'm not a Suzuki teacher, um, so. But for me, the easy way out is: oh, you got a bow problem. Here's Chef Chick, do it. Here's Shraddick, do it. Here, you know, Wolfhart, Kreutzer, all that stuff. But what I want to do is to break up little snippets of those pieces and say, hey. Let's learn from that. Let's learn from from Francis Wong's piece. Let's learn from Crystal Grant's piece. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Our technique. So, and I, and and I want to ask. And I've had like I have a couple. Ever since I put the um, stuff on the website, uh, my racial justice statement, I've been getting calls from students. Like I have this uh, Indian family. I have a Peruvian family um, signed up. But the uh, you know asking them for their uh, like heritage, like folk songs from their heritage, if they want to play them, learn them on the violin. I have a Puerto Rican family I teach. So, um, oh, and then also the improvisation. We do that as well, because I really think that's really finding their voice within themselves, like truly feeling, oh, wow, I can do this. Breaking down that wall of, um, you know, uh, fear to be who they are. So, mm -hmm. yeah, finding the change. Oh, walking the walk. That's my last thing. Or well, maybe it's not my last thing. But yeah, taking the kids, inviting the kids to the protests, to the vigils, to be a part of it. This was when we were at the Capitol. I took the kids up to um, doing uh, education, protests against the educational platform that was being presented. You know, um, I don't know what's next. I guess that's it. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a video. I just play like one minute. May I do that? Okay. Okay. That that I had the kids in called "Make America Great, Not the Land of Hate Again." I don't know. If you can see <laughs> Make America great, not the land of hate again. America great, great like jazz, great like hip hop, great like powwow, great like Chinese railway workers, great like Noro boys, and yes, 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 on the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. Make America great. I don't want to take all the time with the video. <laughs> okay, I can I include it. it in the chat if you want to watch it. Um, it's But, you know, it and there's Mr. Woodson on the left. I don't know if he's still in on the call. Thank you, he's Matt, here. for showing up if you are. Um, and, and so, but that's, you know, play space too, uh, education, because we went into various restaurants, that one restaurant, um, a Jamaican restaurant serving up, and um, that's at Thaddeus Stevens College right there. And those are the students that I... I grew up with, <laughs> so they grew up with me. So <laughs> I, I've known these kids since they were like uh, 
in fourth grade and and now they're like now they're in college i'm gonna get teary-eyed i better <laughs> share <laughs> yeah awesome yeah so and i love that how like being out in the community shows the community what your studio culture is like yeah this is what we do we just go to protests and perform <laughs> versus like we perform at philan philanthropist things Ooh. <laughs> um you can make that choice as the director right. like this is what we do and and then parents will will come up with their ideas too and say hey there's this thing happening um that i'm involved with with my family um do you think the studio would like to participate because they feel that like trust and welcoming environment to come yeah. to you but that they are important because you're doing inclusive stuff so yeah. that's what a great presentation <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't see but matthew put a clapping sign too after you yeah, yeah. <laughs> put a little symbol up um and for if there's anyone in the audience who's like oh my god i'm just i'm a suzuki teacher like i have i have to do private like i have a repertoire already how am i gonna fit in like these other genres or something the idea was that you would do a workshop like in the winter time and not have to be the expert in another genre because you're already an expert in your <laughs> what you're doing but to say, I can collaborate with people in my community who are experts, and then I don't have to do the most. I don't have to do everything myself. I'm gonna like let go of the power, the need to like be able to control everything and just like say, hey, I appreciate what you do. Will you share it with my kids? And well, your kids, like our kids that we're in community with. Um, and so it's all doable in whatever teaching scenario you're in, you can figure out how does that fit in to, to yours. And Michael has a lot more freedom than some of us who are doing the Suzuki method for some reason. Um, have. And so that was inspiring to see. I'll start my holistic violinist, not a system, anti-system. <laughs> Yes, there you go. Well, we only have like six more minutes. So is there any um, questions that people have for each other or just comments that you want to share with each other um, before we close out? And I'm going to put a survey in the chat in case you have to go sooner. Um, if you're willing to give me your high lows and hopes of this graduation ceremony um, or gems in general. I would love to hear what you think. So the floor is open, Christian. Um, I just wanna say one of the things uh, that I also struggle with just in general as, a, as also like a classical uh, bound teacher is finding ways to just get the kids to connect with the music that we have to play. And I find that like, though we don't always get to play the fun, like hip hop stuff that we get to play, by me actually like trying to involve them in the creative process of how we're gonna play the song. So for example, Though I'm not a Suzuki teacher, I do use a lot of the repertoire there are things. I'm like, so you see this? They didn't put anything. They didn't put any markings, right? So now we get to decide how we're going to play this. Mm -hmm. Are we going to play this loud? Are we going to play it soft? Are we going to play it with a lot of energy? Are we going to play it like more relaxed? Or how, how do you, like, it's, it's you know, one, one of the things that's interesting and it's very difficult, but I find that it's just as important as like having a, a wide repertoire is showing the students how to find their voice in this uppity classical repertoire. <laughs> 
So it's just, it's, 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 it's always, it's always a challenge. And, you know, we find fun pieces for them to play. Most of them are very challenging. So we have to postpone, <laughs> postpone bits of that for a while, but just finding ways to get them to be a part of the process of, no, yes, so-and-so wrote this song, but they are dead <laughs> and you get to play it because they left it for you to play it how you want to play it. You know, and Michael talks about the critics, which are the worst part about performing, <laughs> because it's really our experience and to get the kids to understand that, no, this is not for the uppity people who want who wrote the piece or the uppity people who sponsored the piece or uh, or uh, I forget the word, but paid for the piece to be written. This is for you. This is this. You have to find your way to connect to this, even though it may not be what you think is hip. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, so it's just, it's just always interesting to um, figure out ways to uh, get them to be engaged in something that they feel they don't have a connection to. As unique individual artists. You, may, I, may I say something to that, Christian? Lauren yeah. had her hand raised though. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's hard to see the whole zoom screen i was just gonna say i i um one thing that it ha that really has been a eye-opening thing for me more recently is like just realizing how many different opinions there are about all these composers who are dead <laughs> about all the pieces and how you know everybody's gonna everybody's gonna either like what you do or not there's always gonna be someone who doesn't like it and realizing that it's okay to do something to make a choice for yourself and i think the pandemic for me like really hit that really hit close to home because like when i was at home and not performing i was like well i don't know i don't even really want to practice and i was realizing like because i who am i doing this for right now and i'm like wait a second i can do this for myself and like what do i mm -hmm. enjoy about this and it really made me take out my music and like play it for myself and i didn't have to prepare it for a lesson i'm like what if i played a song that that nobody asked me to play that like I could, I can just do it. Mm. I don't. Nobody has to assign me a piece. <laughs> and it's just like it's wild how that's like baked in. That like mm -hmm. the your teacher's op opinion is like what matters the most. And also that like you have to be told, you have to be given a goal or a project in order to play a piece. And that it's not. It's not like we're often not taught about how to enjoy it and how to make it our own. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm hoping to convey that to my students, I guess, was my, my point in, in bringing that up. <laughs> I, I think Bach is not classical music. And I think when we tell people that, they get thrown off. Why, I really think it's like, we're so, so screwed up with labels. And I had the, that yogi guy I was telling you about set stuff to Bach. He doesn't know much about classical music at all. And he said, I can't, I can't talk to this. I said, that, that isn't classical music. It's, it's, it's music. And when he, when he got that, it just totally opened something up. And I think we're, that, I think we're missing something with like that confines of, of, you know, how to perceive all these dead white guys. You know, so mm -hmm. that's just my my thing. <laughs> it wasn't always that way. Okay. I put the YouTube link in the chat for the for that Make America Great. We had a I lot of that. fun making that. Just so you know. So cool. That was awesome. That was that was absolutely amazing. Honestly. Yeah. That music was from the uh, Chinese American jazz saxophonist Francis Wong, and he you'll see there's a little bit of him at the very end of the video. It's kind of cool when oh, we're fighting against I'm the sorry. pipeline. Oh my god, it's playing. <laughs> and Jake, Christian, I can't wait to see your version at the end of next year. Whoops. With your Detroit artists, Christian, you're gonna make a video like that, right? And the next year yeah. with your co-conspirators. <laughs> with my students too yeah 
It'll have to be in the summertime. Though. <laughs> there you go. Detroit summers are the best. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. I okay. It's three thirty. I ha do have a lesson. Maybe some other people have to go teach as well. Um, and I just want. Do you have something to say, Michael? I am the host. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so don't leave yet. Okay. Should I give it back to you? How do I do that? You don't have oh. to do anything. Um, I just want to invite us all to take a bow together, like at a traditional Suzuki lesson where we bow to each other and say, thank you for teaching me because we all helped each other be better teachers today. So thank you for teaching me. Thank you for teaching me. <laughs> and I will blow out the candle in a minute. Um, so I'm going to leave, but since Michael's the host, <laughs> you guys can stay on and talk. Uh, but I have to go to Star's lesson before volleyball practice. <laughs> but oh my God, this is the moment where it's like, do we really have to leave each other now? Oh God. <laughs> oh, no. But I want to tell you gems to the, the current gems because Bethany is a future gem, obviously, from her wig. Um, <laughs> we know that. Um, that after this, I, I am inviting all of you to reach out to me for a follow up at any point in the next year for an hour just to check in or if you want to do like two half hour sessions at different points in the year if you have like something specific you want my help with like a proposal um or just like touching base um for cheerleading because i literally was a cheerleader you probably aren't surprised <laughs> i never knew that that would like help contribute to like what i do for a living now <laughs> but I believe in all of you and I'm looking forward to more co-conspiratorship collaborations and anytime that you have like a victory or a struggle email the group or use the Facebook group and keep in touch so we can just keep this going and don't forget to do the survey before you leave. Bye. Thank you. Love you. Bye. Bye. Love y'all. Bye. Thank you so much.